الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي علي بن جمي طالب says in a narration نهج البلاغة in reference to the concept we will talk about tonight of freedom he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made you free, so do not sell yourself for anything short. On that note, please help me in starting tonight's topic with the first salawat in honor of the greatest man to walk this earth, Al Habib Al Mustafa Muhammad. The second in honor of the greatest lady to walk this earth. الحوراء البتولة فاطمة And the third with your loudest voices in honor of our Imam Imam Sahib Al-Asri Wal-Zaman Insha'Allah as we enter this holy month in which we commemorate the greatest tragedy ever to occur on this planet a tragedy that will be replayed on the Day of Judgment in many narrations. Inshallah, the first topic that I want to look at that has a application to the 21st century and something that's always looked at in the news within our social circles is the aspect of freedom. And we want to look at freedom through Karbala, inshallah, tonight. And as we know, freedom, when we look at it, Let's go and type in freedom in Google. You'll find three particular areas that people search more than any other. The first of which is the freedom of speech. The second of which is the freedom of religion. And the third of which is the freedom of expression. Now, inshallah, we want to look at these particular aspects through the Islamic perspective tonight. And through the, the glance of Imam Hussein on the 10th of Muharram. How can we hold on to the rope of Imam Hussein when looking at a particular aspect that is so applicable on the 21st century, which is freedom? Now, inshallah, we'll look at it in two particular stages. Number one, the problems that occur that might make us delusional as to what is freedom. And I say this, and I need everyone's close attention when we get up to this particular aspect, and this is the aspect of terrorism. How does that apply to freedom? We'll look at it in reference to the hadith that we have, because there are many different types of terrorism that we will explore tonight. So inshallah, to start off, we find that many people have taken freedom into their lives, which are not is from Islam. Don't believe in Islam. However, they've taken the grandson of the Prophet, which is Imam Hussein, and applied the aspect of freedom to their lives. One person, which is known as the father of the nation in India, better known as Mahatma Gandhi, he takes Imam al Hussein in an aspect of freedom and the very famous lines that he says when he says, if I had the 72 companions or the likes of the 72 companions of Imam Hussein, I would have won freedom for my country in less than 24 hours. That's one aspect. However, when we look at freedom, we find that even in the aspect that Gandhi looked at it, you find that freedom as a definition is to have or not have a lack of outside control. Meaning you have total freedom of what you want to do. How you should think and how you should apply yourself. And that's when someone looks at it, they don't look at it as being a chain. Because freedom is outside chains. And we can look at the simile which we've discussed before, which is the simile of the cave. And the aspect we want to look at tonight on the first level, Imam Hussein tries to instill in us that yes, freedom is removing the chains from you. To be free is to remove the chains. 
What are these chains? That's what we'll discuss tonight. How can we remove these chains when holding on to the rope of Imam Hussein alayhi afdal salati was salam? Imam Hussein has a narration in Bihar al-Anwar, volume 68, page 156. He says when a man comes to him and he says, I am of your Shia. I am your followers. I am of your Shia, O Imam. The Imam replies to him, say, do not be a liar. I'm your Shia. He says, don't be a liar. Why? He says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reply to you by saying you are a liar. He says, why? He says, our Shia, look at this quote. He says, our Shia are the ones that hearts are pure and they are free, unchained from stuff such as treason and insincerity. Don't call yourself Shia. He says, call yourselves a lover of Ahlul Bayt. Call yourself a friend of Ahl al-Bayt. Don't you look at yourself in that aspect. So freedom, look at it nowadays. When we research freedom on the internet, when we open our channels, we find that people try to instill in our thoughts that freedom is a freedom of expression. We find many marches in the city that have many names and their colors are that of the rainbow. When they walk, everyone looks up to them saying, this is freedom. You can express yourself even though it's looked down. Because secular society allows you to. And we'll discuss how this in itself we can disclose as being terrorism. For them to show this and tell you this is how you should think. This is how you should be. This is how you should feel towards this particular aspect that we show on TV. It's a strong word, terrorism. It's a very strong word. Can it apply to this aspect? Yes. The first aspect which is terrorism which applies nowadays. Imam Hussein, what happened to him? When he was doing or performing his hajj, he was taken out of the holy land, which Allah in the Quran says that anyone that goes there has salvation. No one is to harm him. They went and attacked Imam Hussein, even in the holy Kaaba. And they drew him out of the holy Kaaba. Terrorism or not terrorism? When you look at the definition of terrorism, we find that it's looked at to be an unauthorized force. Unauthorized force. Whether it be violence or intimidation. This outside force is looked at to be terrorism. Let's look at terrorism within our societies. When we look at anyone outside the school of Ahl al-Bayt, as we know, the school of Ahl al-Bayt tell us that make sure that you question, make sure that you understand, make sure that you have a solid foundation where you stand. So whenever someone will ask you, what is your religion? What do you believe in? Why is this halal? Why is this haram? Why do the followers of Ahl al-Bayt believe in such and such? We have to have in our knowledge a solid belief. That's why our school of thought says question everything. So you have a solid foundation, a solid understanding of everything. You go to outside the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt. We might not know this, but when we look at first-hand examples, we begin to understand how much we have of ocean of knowledge and understanding. The true meaning when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries to teach us, let's go out and learn. Teach yourself, gain knowledge, and the correct type of knowledge. Where does terrorism come into this? The first example, I want, because terrorism, people look at it as someone coming out and has some bomb and then he blows himself up. Yes, that's one aspect of terrorism. Threats, danger, yes. But did we discuss, terrorism can be looked at as intimidation and violence to achieve a political agenda. Now when we find in the time, even of our prophets, our imams, we had a Khalifa at the time that stood on the Prophet of the Prophet of Islam by the name of Harun al-Rashid. Let me try to make a close analogy of what terrorism in this aspect is. Harun al-Rashid is in a courtroom. One person stands up and he's giving a khutbah. He's starting to speak about the, uh, the teachings of the Prophet, how you should live your lives. And out of nowhere, he begins with this hadith from Abu Huraira. He begins to say that, Nabi Allah Musa, Obviously, we don't believe in this, but I'm narrating to show you an example of what terrorism can be like and how we're affected nowadays. He gets up and says, Nabi Musa, once upon a time, saw our prophet Adam and he told him, are you the cause that we have been sent down from heaven? So a person from Quraysh thinking, well, Musa, 
lived how many thousands of years after Adam? How can they actually come into contact? What's going on? So he's questioning it. So he got up in the majlis. It's from Quraysh. Very known, very prestigious to be associated with Quraysh. The origin. So he gets up and he questions it. He says, how can Musa go with Adam or see Adam? Is it, he's trying to give him analogies. Is it that he might have saw him in his dream? Is it that he might have saw him in Alam al-Ru'ya, in heaven? How is it that he saw him to tell him that? Straight away, look at this is where terrorism comes into application. Straight away, what does Harun Rashid do? He calls him. His executioner says, come. Bring your sword. He says, what's the problem? He says, go and cut off that person's head. Excuse me? He says, go cut off that person's head. Why? Has he done anything wrong? He says, he's questioning the hadith of the Prophet of Islam. Anyone can come and fabricate hadith. That's why we have something called sahih and not sahih. That's why we have chains of narrations, science of hadith. Science in which we look at each individual within the chain to see is he reliable, is he not reliable. Straight away, look at the agendas. Gets up, go and cut his head off. He's questioning what we say. Nowadays, when we look at ISIS, when we look at terrorism, don't question. First-hand perspective, I'm telling you that when we go to schools, and I've been there for many years, from kindergarten onwards, we find that they, when they try to teach their Islamic studies, you might have a question. One of the questions I had was, why is it that we're learning three types of wudu? As in the Quran clearly states, two times that you wash particular areas and two times that you wipe. Quran is very distinct and very clear in this aspect. Why is it that we had to learn three types of wudu? So I had a question in my mind. Once I thought to myself, let me just ask the teacher in front of everyone. So I asked the teacher, why is it that we have three types of wudu? Are they all right? The Quran says something. We're not doing anything in, in accordance to the Quran as in what's going on. Straight away, the teacher in front of everyone would humiliate me. And he says, you know what? You're in after school detention. No one be like him and question. I'm not saying someone else thought this has happened to me. First hand perspective. You're not allowed to question. Don't question. Whatever I say, take. Right, wrong, doesn't understand, you don't comprehend it, doesn't matter. Take it. As in when ISIS was caught, this is one of the narrations. From a first-hand perspective, primary source, he says, I was in the jails. When we captured the people from ISIS, we put them in these jails, we feed them, we clothe them, but they would not speak to us. Why? We're taking care of you. They said they would not speak to anyone of the followers of Ahlul Bayt. He says, what's going on? Why don't you speak to us? One of them spoke out once. What did he say? He said, well, the reason why we don't speak towards the followers of Ahlul Bayt is we've been taught a particular... Tradition. He says, what's this tradition? He says, if you speak to a follower, if you speak, terrorism, if you speak to a follower of Ahlul Bayt, you have to fast three days because you become impure. Take that into account. When people are bombarding you and telling you and making you afraid and intimidating you in an aspect where you're not allowed to question, you take everything that you are given. How can we say that this isn't terrorism? That's why it came, comes into perspective that the first aspect when we may overlook the aspect of freedom is when someone else tells us how to think, how to move, how to react. As in, of course, you can listen to scholars, but not once did a scholar come and says, well, this is Islam and you have to do it whether you like it or not. No. The Quran says, you do not force someone into religion. But we see forceful behavior left, right and center. Give you another example. Abu Huraira once. There's a tradition that Abu Huraira comes and he goes towards Ruqayya, which was one of the girls, as they say, was the daughters of the Prophet. We don't believe that she was the daughter of the Prophet. She was a Rabiba, which was the daughter of Khadija's sister, which was raised in the house of the Prophet. The narration said, look at this narration. Ruqayya dies two years after Hijrah. Two years after Hijra Ruqayya dies. Abu Huraira comes to Islam seven years after Hijra. Let's look at this aspect. Ruqayya dies two years after Hijra. Abu Huraira becomes a Muslim seven years after Hijra. Five year gap between the death 
of Ruqayya and between what? The Islam of Abu Huraira. There's a tradition that says, and a long tradition, saying the merits of the third Khalifa based on a conversation that Abu Huraira had with Ruqayya. Someone comes and says, well, how did they meet if she was dead and he wasn't even a Muslim at the time? We want to question it. Don't question. Take. That's why the school of Islam comes. The school of Ahl al-Bayt teaches us, keep your foundations strong. Keep your basis strong. Learn. When we come to commemorate Imam Hussein, he died. So we remember the true Islam. Islam was at a stage. Can you imagine that they would chase from one country to another the grandson of the Holy Prophet? The grandson of the Holy Prophet, the Prophet that brought this religion. They chased him from one place to another, thinking that by killing him they would attain high rank. That's when the aspect of terrorism comes in. This is how you should think. Do not question. Ahlul Bayt come and say, no, question every movement and make sure that every single act that you do is in the right path. Every single act that you do has been already treaded by the Ahlul Bayt. You are only following in their footsteps. Only following in their footsteps. There's many other narrations. When we find this aspect of intimidation, Sayyid al-Fali has a, a beautiful story. When he narrates in the time of Saddam, in the time of Saddam, there was a Sayyid, gets up on the pulpit, and he says these particular verses from the Holy Quran. He says, Tabbat yada Abi Lahabin. What's happening? The same night, the guards of Saddam come and drag this particular Sayyid all the way towards their courts. What's going on? He begins to ask, What's going on? So the guards begin to ask this Sayyid, he says, did you or did you not? Because he was very heavy on the Arab versus Ajam thing. That's what he had, Saddam. He didn't have the aspect of Islam. The best amongst you in the eyes of Allah are the most God conscious or the most pious. He comes to the Sayyid, the guards, they said, did you or did you not curse the Arabs on your pulpit tonight? He says, hold on, what do you mean? I've cursed the Arabs on, my, on the pulpit of Imam Hussein. He says, yes. How have I cursed the Arabs on the pulpit of Imam Hussein? He says, did you or did you not say, Tabbat yada Abi Lahab in Watab? He says, of course, I've said that. He says, is, is Abu Lahab an Arab or not an Arab? He says, he's an Arab, he's from Quraysh. He says, therefore, you've cursed the Arabs. Did you see the aspect? How they twist the words, how they make... What they want to be the right path, the right path. They twist anything in a manner in which they can prosecute you. That Sayyid was taken because he said a verse from the Holy Quran and executed. Is that or is not intimidation? Because they think that one person, if they take him away, they would intimidate their followers that follow in his footsteps. How many times do we see terrorism in the times of the Khalifas? One after another. Times when the ziyarah of Imam Hussein was forbidden. A time which they used to cut off their hands. You had to give up a limb to go towards the ziyarah of Imam Hussein. In a time where the, the ziyarah of Imam Hussein was a numerical factor that can be counted. Because they used to cut off their hands. People would come the next year, cut off the next hand, cut off the legs. Some would take their eyeballs out because there's no other limbs to cut off. And that's why we have the famous tradition لَوْ قَطَّعُوا أَرْجُلَنَا وَالْيَدَيْنَ نَأْتِيكَ سَحْفًا سَيِّدِي يَا حُسَيْن Think on that we need allowed salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So the first aspect of freedom is something we need to look at. Meaning Imam Hussein died so we can begin to question why is it that there was Muslims that killed Muslims? Why is it that there was a salah, jama'ah on one side, whilst they're praying, the other Muslims are attacking them with bows and arrows. And on the other side, there was also an adhan, also a jama'ah. What differentiates these people from those people? That's what we need to look at. Until now, people still praise the Khalifa that killed Imam Hussein. And in a couple of nights, we want to look at the aspect through the speech of Abba Fadl al-Abbas differentiating for us who was Yazid 
And who was Imam Hussein? And that's why we need to begin to question when he came to show us freedom, is to give us freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of religion. Yes, not the manner in which the media portrays it, no. The manner in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed it upon us through the Ahlul Bayt. And that's what we have to look at. So the first aspect is the aspect of terrorism, whether it be violence or intimidation. Number two, an aspect we overlook that may be chaining us from freedom. What is it? Possessions. How? Imam Ali alayhi salam has a beautiful tradition. Beautiful tradition. He says that he categorizes all worshippers into three aspects. Bihar al-Anwar, 78, volume 78, page 117. He categorizes everything from worshippers into three particular categories. He says, number one, there's a worshipper or the worshipping of the coward. What's the worshipping of the coward? He says most of the people lie under this. The worshipping of the coward is the people that worship Allah in fear of hellfire. We're scared. What's the second category? He says the second category of worshippers is the businessman. Why? He says in greed for there, for Allah's heaven. I want such and such reward. I want such and such reward. I want such and such reward. I want such and such hurry. And that's what the people look at when they try to give people these bombs and say, go, you will have dinner with the Prophet. People die and they have a spoon in their pocket. How, how ignorant can someone be? Let's go kill the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. Let's go kill the people that go towards the ziyarah of Sayyid al-Shabaab Ahl al-Jannah to go towards Jannah. Let's go kill the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the one that differentiates between heaven and hell. Qasim al Jannati wa nar. Let's kill them and we might go to heaven. And that's the ignorance, brothers and sisters. So, possession is number two. He says, on the third level, those two types of people that worship, the third one is who? He says, the third is the worship of the free man. How? What makes you entitles you to be a free man? He says, the third being a free man is the one that found Allah worthy to be worshipped and wants to thank him in any manner. Thus, he worships him. That's the aspect we have to look at. How did Imam Hussein teach us this on the 10th of Muharram? When we look at possessions, how many people do we know that turned away from religion? The biggest example when we look at is Umar ibn Sa'ad. Possessions overruled his aspect of intellect and his aspect that he wants to go and fight Imam Hussein when he gets a covenant saying what do you want I will give you he says I want Mulk al -Rai. what's Mulk al -Rai? he says I want the governorship of the entire at the time the Persian Peninsula the Persian Peninsula he says I want the governance of that area Give me that and I am prepared to go and kill Imam Hussein. I am prepared to go and kill the grandson of the Holy Prophet that brought this religion. With possession. That won't last him. I didn't even get that possession. When he reads, he begins to tell himself. He says, do I leave this particular governorship that's been given to me? Or do I come back with the bloodstains of Hussein on my hands? Do I leave this and this is what I crave, what I want? Or do I come back with the bloodstains of Imam Hussein on my hands? Then he begins to try to make it seem better for himself to go do that particular act. What does he say? He says, they say that Allah has created a heaven and a hell. He says, they say, begins to tell himself that he says, if this is the case, after I kill Hussein and get my governorship, over a period of two years, I'll make a repentance towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And min So he begins to tell himself. How many of us have been persuaded away from a religion because of a materialistic need? Imam Ali alayhi salam has a beautiful statement. What does he say? When the dunya comes to him, he says, Ya dunya, talaqtuki thalath, la raj'ata li fiha. 
He says, oh, world, I have divorced you three times and there is no coming back after that particular divorce. He says, umruki qasir, your life is but short. Wa khataruki kabir, and your danger is grand. So imagine he gives us this particular aspect, that this is the dunya. There was a sheikh that is a very famous tradition. His name was Sheikh At-Tustari. He was an ayatollah at the time he comes up. Imagine this scenario. Give you an aspect of possessions. He comes up on the pulpit once and he says to the people that were down. Imagine ayatollah crowd. He starts off, he says, we teach everyone that the greatest sin is to do shirk and join a partner to God, isn't it? When you look at the greatest sins, in accordance with Sayyid Dastaqayb al-Shirazi, the greatest sins, the books, the first of which is shirk. So he goes on the pulpit and he says, I want everyone to remain and remove this idea. He says, I'm telling you from the pulpit that I want you to do shirk. And everyone's thinking, what do you mean? This is the greatest sin. He says, no, 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 not in the manner that you're thinking of. Not in the manner that you enjoin a partner to God, no. He says, make Allah a partner of your daily routine and daily life. Your heart doesn't have Allah. Your heart has greed for the dunya. Your heart wants this particular position. Your heart wants this particular amount of money. This particular wife. This particular husband. He says your daily routine. Try to enjoin Allah in this particular routine. Everything that we live within our lives, we don't. And we separate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from it. He says try to enjoin Allah in every act. He says from that aspect, but he got their attention. They began to rearrange the order in which they live their life. And I end on two particular narrations because I have less than five minutes, inshallah, with you before I end for tonight. Imam Hussein on the 10th of Muharram, when he's down on the ground, the people begin to attack the tents. What does he say? Let's look at this. He says to them, he says, oh, the Shia, and we're going to discuss this in a couple of nights. Because people attribute the concept of Shia only towards the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. Let's look at Imam Hussein and what he says about Shia. He says, Ya Shi'at. He says, Oh, the Shia of Al-Abu Sufyan. If you do not have a religion and do not fear a day of judgment, then at least be free men in your life in this dunya. Why? If you do not have religion, meaning in a particular religion, someone might have biased. Someone might be paid or given a couple of ahadith to say, do this, do that. He says, if you don't have a religion and you don't believe in the day of judgment, will you be judged? At least be free men. Why? Because free men don't have any biases. A free man in the actual concept means that he sees everything for it is, doesn't have a bias whether this is right, this is wrong. I have this particular amount of wealth depending if I take this decision or not. And that's why on the 10th of Muharram, the best example that we have of a person that made that decision is Hurra ibn Yazid al -Riyah. Why? Because he was the governor of that army. The person that stopped Imam Hussein. The person that all, every single person within that particular army said, if anyone was to ask us who was the bravest amongst us, we would not hesitate to say it was you. They found him on that night to be in a very scared state. Why? And he asks him, one of his companions, he says, why are you in this state? He says, I am questioning myself. Why? I am putting myself in the middle, whether it's heaven or hell that I'm going towards. He says, if I die with Imam Hussein, I see heaven. But if I fight against him, I see only hell. And that's why we have to take that decision from tonight. We have to put ourselves in that balance from tonight. Either we look at our a'mal, our actions, and say we're going towards heaven, or we go towards hell. And if we're going towards hell, well, ayyadu billah, and that's not the case with any of the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. We want to hold on to the rope of Imam Hussein in these 10 nights so we may gain closeness towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we end on this note, brothers and sisters, and we pray to Allah, inshallah, through these 10 nights that he may grant us the light to see the path that we need to follow.
He may grant us an elevated rank in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the eyes of the Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. And we want to end with the blessing of Surah Al Mubarakat Al Fatiha to go towards everyone that is in need of it. Al Mu'minin Al Mu'minat, the living of them and the deceased. And inshallah, but before it, three of your loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs>